it takes a snapshot of all the birds that are spending the winter with us. Because that's really helpful if we're looking at things like climate change or winter weather patterns in birds. And we can see this over a long period of time. Actually, the Christmas bird count's been going on for right about or a little over 120 years. So we have a really good picture of what the birds look like across not just North America, but the whole places all over the world. It's also a really, really great way to get into birding. So if you've never been birding before, or you just, you like birds, you've never been out looking for them, or you want to learn more about birds, the Christmas bird count's a great opportunity. Kind of the catchphrase of the Christmas bird count is like, can you recognize a cardinal, right? And maybe you don't recognize a cardinal yet, but when you notice a big, you know, a big red bird in the winter time, that's a great start, right? But like I said, it's the best day of birding all year. It might be 10 degrees or it might be 45 degrees. It depends on what kind of winter we're having. And even if it's 10 degrees, it can be so much fun to get out there and see what's going on. It'll take you to different places where you might not have been, even though they're close by. So what I want to say real quickly is one of my favorite Christmas bird count stories. And it turned into a Christmas cow count for me. So one year, and this is in Sharon, I'm walking around having a really great time. I'm seeing some awesome birds. I'm really excited. I saw a brown creeper. Oh, I'm excited. And I stop because I hear this really loud sound moving through the, the brush in the woods. It's really dense brush. I hear cracking and creaking. And I'm like, oh, uh-oh, that's a bear. And then I see really dark shapes, two of them, huge, walking through the brush. And I start to step back and I go, whoa, bear, whoa, bear. And then I notice they're Oreo bears. <laughs> and I realize they're cows. There was two cows that got loose and went right into the middle of the field. <laughs> it's one of my favorite Christmas bird count stories because you never know what's going to happen on a random day in the winter. So the Christmas bird count for us and Sharon, right, is so all across the world, there's these 15 mile circles, right? And they all have a center point and 15 miles around that center point. And you search for all the birds you can find in that circle, not just each type of bird, but how many there are. So maybe there's a thousand chickadees in that circle, right? And then we can, then they can compare that from year to year to year, right? And not just chickadees, but all bird species, right? And you'll see on the map I have here, and maybe I have to move this, <laughs> all right? There's a lot of different circles. These circles, like I said, are all over the US, all over the globe. And some of them have been, around for longer times than others. Ours is about 60 years. But the Christmas bird count didn't start off as a Christmas bird count. It's more like the Christmas bird hunt, right? And you might hear lots of different stories about this as um, some people say it got started as the Christmas side hunt where people walked on sides of the fields to come together and basically they shot all the birds they saw, right? And there was a long history of this before the 20th century of people going out around Christmas and shooting birds, right? That's how a lot of it got started. But somewhere around, you know, 1900, I think the first Christmas bird count is technically counted in the year 1900. So right about there, there's this transition of hunting and killing birds to counting them. Let's see how many there are. Right? And this is part of the history of conservation as well. At the turn of the 20th century, we see this change in how people see animals and the environment a little bit. So we went from first Christmas bird hunts to the Christmas bird count. All right. And over time, it's changed a lot. Well, actually not changed a lot, but it's grown a lot. Right? And it turned into this huge worldwide citizen science project. Right? And it's not just, you know, a count, all right, we counted the birds, all right, great. 
It's actually data that's used by scientists. And it's all of us volunteers all across the world looking for birds. It's not just paid scientists out there looking for birds. It's everybody from counting chickadees to red-tailed hawks to anything that's around. It's this awesome snapshot. And it works really, really well with some new citizen science projects like eBird, which is another opportunity for you to get involved as a volunteer to share your bird sightings. And scientists can use all of this data. So with Christmas Bird Count and eBird, we have this awesome set of information about what birds are being around. And eBird is a whole fun talk on its own. You can learn so much about getting into birds just by visiting eBird. All right, so here's what it looks like, right? Say December 20th this year for us, it's about, it's scheduled two weeks before and about two weeks after Christmas, somewhere in that period of time, based on the, you know, the winter solstice, all right? So right in that time, all across the globe, right, people are going out but for us on December 20th, that's a Sunday, and you can count birds from 12 a.m. to 12 p.m. That's a long time especially since most of that's darkness. So that's okay, you don't have to go out in the darkness, but if you're as crazy as I am, I go out and um, my partner Evelyn, we go out at maybe two or three in the morning looking for owls. So if you see a strange person standing in a field going, woo, 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 right? Might be someone doing a Christmas bird count. It's a lot of fun. I love looking for owls, right? because they're really tricky and they make cool sounds. So 24 hours, you count all the birds in there, right? And for us, like I said before, our circle is right around Hotchkiss School, right? That's the center of our circle. So within our big 15 mile circle, we have nine different sections and teams go out in those sections as a group. Now this year it's gonna be a little bit of different because of COVID. So people aren't going to be driving in cars together and we'll be wearing masks and socially distanced. So it's going to look a little different, but we'll be doing some of those same things. And we basically look everywhere on bird feeders, in cemeteries, in parking lots, on rooftops, on streets, in farm fields, in the forest, in wetlands, anywhere you can imagine, because we want to get a a, a picture of every single bird that's here for the winter. All right, and don't forget your bird feeders. And this year, more than ever, it's gonna be super important to watch your bird feeders because there's so much of us that, so many of us that are at home. Right? And the other really cool thing is there's lots of birds coming from far north in Canada that are stopping at bird feeders. So this is a great year to get into the Christmas bird count, even if you're just staying at home. Right? So if you wanna participate, you have to join a team, right? You notice on the map, there's circles all over the US, but you might not live in one of those circles. So if you're outside of that circle, your maybe your feeder doesn't count as part of the birds in the circle, but you could contact somebody to get a to join their circle or join a team in their circle. And if you go and if you search Christmas bird count, you'll go to the Audubon page and it'll help you find where there's circles and where there's compilers and who to contact. If you are interested in the, right, the Lakeville Sharon count, Trixie Strauss bird count, right? You can contact me. There's my email address there. I hope you can see that. Let me move my... <laughs> All right, there you go, right? You can, you can contact me even if you're just staying at home and you're in one of those circles, your feeder really counts. And we actually have, there's forms at the Audubon Center where you can pick up and fill those out and send them in to me. All right, so with that, Wendy, do we want to take questions now or we want to wait a little bit? Does any if anybody has any questions about Christmas bird count, we can take a few of those now. Um, for the feeder forms, if you are interested in participating in the feeder form, uh, the feeder watch, I can um, email you the feeder forms if you're interested in those. You can just shoot me an email or um, 
or let me know in the chat and I can send those out to everybody. And even if you even if you don't know what bird species are, you, maybe you don't recognize a species, or maybe you only know one or two, like a chickadee or a cardinal. Those species are so so important to the Christmas bird count, and we'll probably talk about that in a little bit. Anyhow, all right. And why don't I just share one more little PowerPoint about what are these birds doing in the winter and how do they survive? And this will be quick. All right, so what I like to say is that come say August, September, right? Birds have a choice, right? Do they stay or do they migrate, all right? And for 70% of our birds, they're choosing the migrate option. Some of them might not be going very far. Like uh, a lot of robins might just be going to a few states farther south, right? But birds like our Baltimore Oriole are going really far. And this is kind of a map. All of this pink area is where they breed in the summer. And then they're going to end up way down here in the winter. So a lot of birds do that, right? They migrate. But if they don't migrate, they have to stay here. And they have all of these amazing challenges. And that's why the Christmas bird count is so cool. Because you're getting this snapshot, right, of birds that have to stay warm all winter long, despite maybe really cold temperatures. Here's a bird that might not even come as far south as Connecticut or Massachusetts. <laughs> A lot of them stay in the boreal, the boreal area in Canada. Really incredible. But keeping more warm means you constantly have to be minding your feather positions. You see the bird here in the picture. He, he's all, you know, all wonky. He's got feathers all over the place. Because as soon as he sat down on this branch, puffed up and settled down. Because the way the feathers are positioned help keep the warm in them keep the, the warmth, the hot air close to the skin. They also pick where they're hanging out, these little microclimates. Maybe it's in a pine tree, maybe it's in a clump of leaves, maybe it's near a rocky area that gets lots of sun. And some of them change their metabolism around, right? Like chickadees that might slow their metabolism at night a little bit or speed it up a little bit, depending on the weather and how much food they have. And some of them, they change where they spend the night, maybe in a hollow of a tree, maybe in a, pine, a, bu a bunch of pine boughs, right? They can change it around. And then there's this really, that's really, really complicated, but really amazing, right? Is that birds have this awesome adaptation where they can keep themselves warm, even if they're on snow or ice, gulls, are really known for sitting on ice in the winter, right? And you'd think, well, that's gotta get cold. But because they got, they have warm blood from their heart going out to their feet, it gets cold way out in their feet and it comes back into the body. But because their veins and arteries are right next to each other, the warm blood heats up the cold blood and they can conserve a lot of energy, right? And it also depends what they're eating. Some food sources have a lot more energy and are better to keep them warm in the winter, right? And they sometimes they need to change it up. They need to eat a lot of different things, whatever insects are around, seeds and berries, stuff that's really good for them. And some birds right, even store their food for the winter. Our black-capped chickadee is really cool because it stores food in the winter and its brain gets bigger in order to remember all the places it stored its food, right? So this little bird, you know, just a little bit, this little bird spends its whole winter here in New England, even though it's so small, it braves the cold, finds the food, stores the food. So it's kind of a really cool story. And then there's this other thing that happens in the winter that maybe it's a bird from way far north. So they're used to the very, very cold, but they might, maybe they come down just a little bit, maybe into New England a little bit. This is called eruption. These are birds that move just a little bit to find food. 
they're not going as far south as, say, Florida or the tropics, but they're coming just a little bit south where there's a little bit more food, and that's finches, and the hatches, and blue jays, and even owls like the snowy owl. So that's a little bit about what they're doing in the winter. Zach, if you don't mind, Hannah was wondering if you could just go back through your slides real quick and tell us some of the birds that were in those slides. Yeah, I know them. sorry. She said that <laughs> they weren't familiar. She wasn't familiar uh, with some of them. <laughs> I included them just as nice things to look at while I was talking. <laughs> so this one is our common red pole, which is a bird coming from Canada um, that I don't know if any of them breed in the northern New England at all. Um, so this one's coming from Canada. And right now, I've seen as many as 130 or 140 in a group together. Um, so they're coming down in big numbers, and they'll eat all of your bird seed. So that was our black cat chickadee. Here's another bird coming from the north. It's a really special year. This is called the pine grosbeak. And this is a female pine grosbeak, a little pale red, yellow. And the males are like a deep, dark red in the face. Right. This one's a Ross's gull. We don't really get them, but they, because they don't leave the Arctic Circle almost ever, even in the winter. And this one is our northern shrike, which we do get in the winter, right? And it's famous for catching its prey like birds or small rodents and impaling them on thorns to eat them later. All right. I think that's it. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. Okay, so what we're going to do, and thank you very much for that, Zach. Now you guys know how birds actually survive through the winter. And winter is a great time for anyone to start birding if, if you're trying to get into this, because you may have noticed there are not quite as many birds around at this time of year as in the middle of the summer when we have all the, the migrating songbirds back in the area, and they're just everywhere. So in the winter time, those songbirds have already migrated, they're out of the area, and we just have a select few that kind of hang around here and that we see very often. So if you're just starting out birding, it's a great time to start because it's it's easy for us to kind of um, just, just learn a little bit about what we're looking for when we're trying to identify birds. So when those others start migrating back, you'll already be on to it and can move on to the harder species. And then you can tackle the warblers, which I still am having a difficult time with some of them. Um, so uh, one thing to do, if you are learning how to um, identify birds, there's always a few things that you wanna go by all the time, okay? One main really important thing is to go by the overall size of the bird. Okay, so size is important. If you see a bird, you want to ask yourself, um, how big is it? Now, everybody is probably familiar with a robin. So a lot of people will compare the size of a bird to a robin. So if the bird is smaller than a robin, you can ask yourself, okay, would it fit in the palm of my hand? Because then you can kind of go to that little batch of birds that would fit in that category. Or it can be more robin size, or is it larger than a robin? It's a very large bird. So you want to go, basically, is it going to fit in my hand? Or is it going to be a little bit bigger than my hand? Or is it huge, something that's going to be sitting on my hand and taking up, you know, that I need both arms? So size is very important when you're trying to identify a bird. Um, the second thing is colors. Okay, now... There are, in the wintertime, colors, the plumage changes, their feather color changes in some birds. And um, they're not as bright as a lot of the, the birds that you see here in the summertime. But there are some colors, like Zach mentioned, the cardinal, um, which really sticks out. So if you see a bright red bird at your feeder, that's going to be easier to identify. You're going to be able to find that a little bit easier because of those bright colors. You might also see something like a blue jay, which is very blue and stands out. So you want to look at size, you want to look at the colors. You also want to ask yourself, are there any unusual markings on the bird or just something kind of strange or unique about the bird that really stands out to you? Because that's going to help you find them in your bird guide, on your app, on your phone, on the internet. Um, so something like this, for example, you might say, oh, I saw a bird and it looks like it's wearing a black cap on its head or a black hat. That is something that's really gonna help you with the identification of the bird. 
Um, does it have like a, a pointy head or does it look like it's having a bad hair day? You know, with these little feathers sticking straight up or everywhere. That's gonna help you identify this bird very quickly. Another thing that you can do to help you identify birds is where are they when they're at their feeder? Okay, are they on a tube feeder? Or on, are they on the ground below your tube feeder eating the seed that's spilling to the ground? Um, something, if you have a tree nearby your feeders, is there a bird that's kind of going, pointing down, okay, rather than up? Okay, all those are clues that are gonna help you narrow down to figure out what the bird is that you're looking at. So you wanna look at size, color, unusual or unique markings, and its behavior, basically. Where is it? How is it feeding? Is it scratching at the ground a lot? Is it picking up a lot of little seeds and flying away? Or is it take one seed, eat it, get another seed, eat it? And all that stuff is going to help you really pinpoint what the bird is, okay? I see a bunch of things coming in the chat. So before we start going over the 12 birds of Christmas bird count, Let's just see if, uh, are you taking care of it, Zach? Yep, I, there was one question though about feeders and seed. I didn't know if, uh, what, um, what you're all doing this year for that. At the center, you mean? Yeah. We, uh, well, the center is still closed, so you can call the center um, and we can help you get bird seed. We do have seed and feeder still available, but you just have to call and arrange pickup and payment there. And I can talk more about that at the end if you want to. All right, so I'm gonna share my screen here. And we are going to go over the 12 birds of Christmas bird count. And the 12 most common type of birds that you're gonna see at your feeders um, this winter. Okay. All right, so in trying to identify a bird, you, it's easy to know what they are and how to identify them if you know the parts of a bird. Okay, so if if um, someone calls us up at the Audubon Center, and says, I saw this bird um, and I want to know what it is. Okay, we're going to ask you some questions. Well, what did it look like? It's going to be easier for us to help you or for you to find it in a book or on your app if you know some of the general terminology. So here's kind of the basic parts of a bird. Um, and the things that you're gonna look for to help you identify. One of the things you wanna look for up here is the top of the head, and that is called the crown. Just like a king or a queen would be wearing a crown on the top of their head. A lot of birds have all these little caps or different colors on their crown that'll help you identify them. Another term that you might hear is the nape, and it's basically the neck area, okay? Of course, the back. That's pretty self-explanatory. The rump is the bird's bottom, but it's not underneath the tail feathers like you might think. It's kind of at the base of the tail um, on the very bottom of the back. So it's between the, the back and the start of the tail. That's his little rump. And there are some birds that have different colors on their rump. I actually have a bird called a yellow rumped warbler and rightfully so because they have a little yellow patch right there on their rump. So it makes it easy to identify them. Of course, we have the tail, the leg or the tarsus and the foot. Underneath here on the bottom of the bird, right above the legs is its belly. And that's different than the upper part of the bottom of the bird that is known as the breast. So it's like the chest area is known as the breast and underneath that is the belly. Okay, so those are two parts of the bird that a lot of times help us identify with the colors or the patterns that might be on the breast or the belly. And then the throat is right here where you would think of our neck being. So the nape is the back of the neck, the throat is the front, just like on our throat. Of course, the bill and the beak. Um, sometimes birds will have what we call an eyebrow or an eye stripe. There might be a line of color right here above the eye as well. And sometimes on the wings itself, there might be stripes or patterns and we would call those wing bars. So you'll see those on a couple that we go over today. Can I, can I throw one thing in? Absolutely. And I, I know always, this is really quick. I always, yeah, it's really quick. My, I always say that um, one of the most misidentified birds is the red headed woodpecker, right? And people say, well, it's got red, the head's red, but is, that, is there red on the crown, on the nape, right on the back of the head? 
or is its head red, right? <laughs> so right. ask yourself those questions. Yeah, and um, I think I had that on one of the slides too about oh. the head. Oh no. <laughs> no, because it is so commonly um, you know, misinterpreted. So we're gonna start off with the one that a lot of people know already, okay? And this is the black cat chickadee. Um, it's a favorite little winter bird um, known for calling its name chickadee dee dee dee, chickadee dee dee. But they also do um, a little whistle. And um, Zach's usually better at sounds, or he might have <laughs> sounds. Um, oh, here, I actually have the little stuffed bird. Here. So you might hear them calling over the winter time with that little whistle as well. So when we're trying to identify the black capped chickadee, again, we start off with the size. This is a small winter bird. It would definitely fit in the palm of your hand. Okay, and some people, if you're uh, if you're bril uh, really brave enough to sit out in the cold with seed in your hand, they're one of the first birds that would actually come up and sit on your hand to eat seed out of your hand. Um, you just have to sit there a while to get them used to you and not move to get them to come to your hand, but it would fit in the palm of your hand. It is called a black cap chickadee, again, because of that black cap, okay? So you can see the arrow here pointing. Looks like it's wearing a black hat on the top of its head, on its crown. Now, black hat chickadees look the same year round. So they're not gonna change the color. They're gonna have that black cap year round. Um, so they're easy to identify once you know them. Uh, another thing other than the black cap is they also have this black, what looks like he's wearing a black bib on his throat area. So he's got a black cap, white cheeks, and then a black throat. So you have that kind of Oreo type head there with the cream in the middle on <laughs> the two cookie pieces, the black cap, the black throat, and the white cheeks. Um, mostly grayish overall with kind of a lighter, um, still grayish belly, but lighter than its back and wings. Uh, the chickadees are often found in little flocks of chickadees. And that doesn't mean they're all gonna come to your feeder at one time, but you might see a chickadee fly in, grab a seed and go off, and then another one will come in, another one will come in. But there's usually chickadees around your feeders um, at one time rather than just one single chickadee. Can I throw one last thing in about the chickadees? Yeah, absolutely. So chickadees are actually one of the most important, all the birds are important to count, but it's really important to count chickadees because one, they're common and two, they're easy to identify-ish, but their populations are really, really expected to decline in the next 50 to 100 years due to climate change. So chickadees, state bird of Massachusetts, and they think that eventually Western Massachusetts might be one of the only places to have black capped chickadees and you know with climate change. So our counting of chickadees now is super, super important important to understand what is happening to them with climate change. And one thing to keep in mind that I didn't mention before is if you are starting out birding, um, don't get frustrated. It, these birds are not going to look exactly the same. Each bird is a little bit different. So the bird that you see at your feeder may not look exactly like the bird that's in your field guide or exactly like the bird that's on your app. Um, you can look at a, a hundred different pictures of the same bird and there's going to be slight variations. Um, fortunately with the black cap chickadee, they all pretty look pretty much look similar. Like they're still going to have the black cap, the black throat and the white cheeks. But uh, don't get frustrated and say, well, it doesn't look exactly like what's here in my book um, because there are going to be variations. And uh, we hear that a lot. And the birds are just, I mean, they're all individuals. They all have individual personalities too. So just keep that in mind. They're not going to look exactly like this picture that I have on the slide or what you're seeing and whatever you're looking at to help you identify. All right, so the second one that I put on here, and I kind of clumped the, these 12 birds together in where they might be eating, the location of your feeders. So you might have tube feeders, um, ground feeders, and then different specialty feeders like your Niger thistle feeders and your suet. So these first four birds I kind of clumped into the, the whole tube feeder. 
group. Um, so these are the ones that are going to be coming to your hanging feeders and going back and forth, maybe to a nearby perch, a nearby tree or bush, coming back and getting a seed and going nearby and eating it. So these are the ones you're going to typically find eating things like black whale sunflower seeds out of your tube feeder. And this is another really common one. A lot of times you see them along with the, the black cap chickadees. And this is a tufted titmouse. Again, it's a small bird, fits in the palm of your hand, okay? One of the easiest ways to tell the tufted titmouse is his little bad hair day. He's got the hair that kind of sticks up in this little triangle. He's got this big crest that sticks up on the top of his head. Um, and it, that's what this arrow is pointing at right here. That they can lay that crest back against their head, um, but oftentimes it's, it's sticking up. So it's pretty easy to see most of the time. So that little tuft on its crown there is where it gets its name, the tufted titmouse. So again, it has this little tuft. It has a little black, um, little black spot right here at the base of its bill has a very black eye too. So those little, two little black pieces really make it stand out with that gray tuft. And that's gonna really be what you're looking for to help you identify this bird. Otherwise, it's pretty much overall gray with a white breast and belly. And it has these little peachy tan flanks or side right underneath those um, feathers, okay? But these birds move quickly on and off your feeders. <laughs> so you might not always see that little, that little peachy tan coloring there. Again, I think the easiest way to help you identify the tuft of titmouse is that tuft on the top of his head. Okay. All right. The next one we have is a night, the uh, white breasted nuthatch. So Zach, I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about this guy. Yeah, so we, ha we have two species of nuthatches that are in Connecticut, uh, but the white-breasted nuthatch is called white-breasted because of the white breast, right? And these birds are maybe a little bit bigger than a uh, black-capped chickadee, but they have similarities to woodpeckers. So you'll notice they cling onto the side of the trees, and like Wendy's showing, it goes oftentimes they're facing down the tree. It doesn't mean they won't go up the tree but a lot of times I'll see them facing down the tree, right? Now that big, long, pointy bill kind of reminds you of the woodpecker, but it's not a big, long bill like a woodpecker, but it's still pretty noticeable, right? And it's got that nice black cap, almost like our chickadee, but it's missing the black on the throat, right? The back of the bird is very bluish gray. So that contrast between the head, the back, and the bright white cheeks. One thing, I think that's one thing that's really noticeable about the white-breasted nuthatch is how white the cheeks are. It's like you've got a black head and bright, brilliant white cheeks. Um, and tail's pretty short for a lot of birds. So, you know, it's not sticking out very much. It's interesting, it's very compact little bird, slim against the tree. And Wendy's got a really good point there of the, the rusty patches near tail not the rump, right? The, I always say this one, actually the butt, the vent, right? And so it's a little rusty under there. So that's kind of the whole thing as a whole. Chick nut hatches are ones that actually make a lot of sound in the winter. So you might still hear them going, me, 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 right? Oops, a two, me, 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 me. And versus a red breast and the is just me, me, me. So groups of two, white breast. And just again, the difference between that and the chickadee is the chickadee has that black neck where the nuthatch has the white. So even though they both have black caps, that's the big difference. And the nuthatch is the one where you want to watch the behavior. If you see them kind of pointing down, they have that behavior a lot where they're going down the tree and they might stick their head out almost like at 90 degrees. Um, <laughs> they make a little L shape on the tree. So that's one that you can watch the behavior and really kind of identify through that. Okay. The next one we have another, <laughs> another common one that you might already be familiar with, but this is a blue jay and um, different than a blue bird. We do have Eastern bluebirds that stick around in the winter time. So you can see blue, blue birds, but this is known as a blue jay. This is a large bird. <clears throat> so a little bit larger than a robin. This isn't one that's just gonna fit in your cupped hand. 
Um, it also has what I call the bad hair day with the big um, pointed tuft on the top of its head on its crown here. And another way to identify the blue jay is that it tends to have a black necklace. So if you think of it wearing a necklace that goes around its head down to the throat here, um, it has that black line. Now some, like this one here in the picture is covered up by some of its white feathers, but you might see another one where it is really, I think here in my cut, cut out here in my picture, um, is really more obvious. Um, has a really kind of a darker stripe or thicker stripe on it, but that black necklace is definitely um, one good thing to look for to identify it. They also have a kind of a, a, a nice thick beak too. They're gonna be eating things like peanuts even in the shell. Um, and so they can really use that thick beak to, um, to wham into the, the harder seeds. Uh, bluish overall, really bright, bright blue in the back and the wings, the tail with some black striping on it um, and mostly white underneath, okay? Blue jays are known to be a little bit aggressive at your feeders, so they will come in and chase other birds away um, and, and steal those, you know, more um, the delicious treats like the peanuts. <laughs> they really like those. Zach, did you have anything to add about the, the blue jay? Um, they make a lot of sounds. So this is a bird you might hear before you see it. They're very noisy. And, and they'll make, you name a sound, they'll make it. They're really good sometimes at mimicking sounds. They're, they're, they sound like birds of prey a lot of times. Um, and so you'll just see, you can hear a strange sound. What's what one bird when someone's like, oh, what's that? And I say, oh, a blue jay. And they say, oh, what's that? A blue jay. What's that? A blue jay, <laughs> right? They make so many different sounds. The common one is that, Jay, Jay! But they sound like squeaky spigots sometimes. <laughs> very, very squeaky, or like a hawk, too. I was just going to say, they make a lot of hawk sounds. Red tailed hawks, they make me look up in the sky numerous times thinking there's a red tailed hawk. And then I think they sit in the tree and laugh at me for trying to find the hawk. In the <laughs> I think sometimes they even sound better than the hawks. In the <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So um, moving on to the, the ground feeders. So these are the birds that it doesn't mean they won't come to your tube feeders or your hopper feeders, but these are the ones that you're typically going to see below your feeders eating the seed that's that's built, a um, or that the other birds are, are kicking out. There are some birds that uh, are not interested. If you have a mixed seed and they have the little white millet, the little white balls in your mixed seed, a lot of the, the tube feeder birds don't like those, so they'll kind of kick those out onto the ground, and then these ground feeding birds will come and clean up that millet. So these are birds that you're going to find more on the ground, um, picking up those, those spilled seeds. And this is one that a lot of people call snowbirds, and I know people get excited for winter when they start seeing these little, um, I don't know, like little Easter egg birds hopping around at your feeders. And this is called a dark-eyed junco. Um, also sometimes called a slate colored junco, um, more commonly called the dark eyed now. But it's a small little round bird, which is why I call it a little Easter egg bird, because um, it's so round. That also could fit in the palm of your hand. So, you know, about chickadee size, maybe a little bit bigger and rounder, plumper than a chickadee. Um, and oftentimes you can see them in small flocks. So you're not you're typically going to see just one junco bouncing around um, eating the seed. There's quite a few of them at a time. Overall, dark colored bird. Um, the females, I believe, are a little bit lighter gray than the males. Males tend to be darker, but just overall that kind of a dark gray color or slate colored gray on the top with a white belly. So it's kind of half and half, like two-toned gray and white. Um, with a little, a small bill that's kind of pink, pinkish in color. So that really kind of um, stands out from the dark gray on the head. One of the things that you can see on the junco, if it flies, is it has these really distinct outer white tail feathers that you can see up in the top right corner of the screen. So when their tail feathers are fanned out, you can really see those outer white feathers on the tail. Um, it's not as obvious when the tail is, um, the, fe the feathers are, are closed, for lack of better words. But as soon as they spread out those feathers, you can see those white when they fly. Oops. Ah, sorry about that. 
Um, Zach, did you have anything to add about the dark? Oh, that's probably the best way to identify juncos is when I get away, they'll be on the side of the road, maybe getting little seeds for their crop to help break up or little seeds and stones for their crop to break up food. So they'll fly up in groups of 10, 20, 30 from the side of the road. And you see those big white flashes. Um, people might say, oh, look at the white flashes on the tail, right? It's a quick little flash. Another cool thing about the juncos are that, um, so where I live in Massachusetts, they actually breed on top of the mountains, not very far down the mountains, almost way on top. And so we have birds actually here and in Connecticut that are coming either from the top of the mountains down or from way far north in Canada down. So it's pretty cool the little journeys they make. Here we have another one. When do you want me to do, do this? Yeah, go for it. You can take the it. Morning, morning doves can be, uh, you might find them alone or you might find them in groups of 10 or 20 sometimes, um, but they are a pigeon-like bird. So they have a pretty round head like you're seeing here, a big eye on the side of their head because they are ground eaters, right? So just like, you know, say deer or something that have their head on the ground, eating off of the ground, eyes on the side to look for predators, right? So a round head, short little beak with a tiny little round end to it to help grab seeds. Not a hook beak like a bird of prey, just a round little end. The one big thing I think about these birds is they're chunky little round, brownish gray birds, <laughs> right? So you'll notice it, right? They're one of these little round, and they're not little, right? They're they're chunkier, but you you could hold them on your hand, right? About the size of your hand, open up. Um, that long thin tail is a really good giveaway too. It is thin and pointy, so when they spread out the tail, it's got a pointy tip of the tail, but then very wide and spread out around it. And their feathers also make sound. So when they're flying, you hear their whistle. The of the wings, right? Or when they're about to land, you hear, <laughs> right? They're so noisy with just their, with just their wings and their feathers, right? So you hear the sound of feathers with wispy whistles. Oftentimes that's a morning dove. And sometimes they'll spend the evening in um, dense pine trees. So when you're on the Christmas bird count early in the morning, maybe looking for owls and you're like, you know, stand the pine trees and you're, you're maybe hooting for an owl morning I'll take off in the middle of the night you're like ah right <laughs> because they're 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 so noisy like that they're very very fast flyers so when you see them during the day they might zip like a falcon over a field or around houses they're very very fast pointed wings as well that help you know helps with that speed those short little legs like Wendy has here in the picture short little pinkish legs they're very squat, round little birds. And they're very skittish too. So you might have some birds if you're outside around your feeders, the, the birds are gonna be coming into your feeders anyway, once they know the seed is there. Morning doves are very flighty. So it does not take much to scare them away. Um, and it seems like whenever they do take off, uh, they're so loud, like Zach said, with the whistling of their wings, but they also tend to leave a lot of feathers behind. <laughs> Um, like a little bird explosion of feathers. So they'll take off, you might see little fluffy feathers around. Fear not, that's just, that's what they do. And it, it's normal. It's just that they do get uh, really skittish and, and will scare off very easily. Um, but, but they're fun birds to have around. And they're also ones that will, once they're there on the ground, they will pick up a lot of millet. So you might see them spending a lot of time in one place, just walking around, picking up that seed because they can really uh, fill their crops with a lot of little millet seed. Um, and then once that crop is completely full and a crop is kind of like a storage tank in the bird for their food. Um, once that crop is filled, then they'll fly off and then they can start digesting the food um, out of the crop. So that's why it might seem like the morning doves are gonna spend more time at one time at your feeders than some of the other birds that might come get one seed and leave, come get one seed and leave. They're gonna pack a punch while they're there and fill up as much as they can. All right, and our another ground feeder that we see quite often is our white-throated sparrow. 
And if you take a look, you can probably guess why he's called a white-throated sparrow. One of the easiest ways to tell. And so the, the good thing about these birds too is their, their real distinct or key identification features are in their name. <laughs> so if you say, hey, look, I saw a bird that has a white throat, could be a white-throated sparrow. So that's one of the good things about these birds too is that will really help with their name. But the white-throated sparrows, of course, have that, that white throat pouch right underneath their beak. They also have a black and white striped head. And you might notice something else that really sticks out on these guys are those, those yellow marks between the eye and the beak um, on the base of their, their head there, um, and right on top of the beak there between the eye and the beak. So we have the bright yellow, black and white striped head, and of course the white throat on the white-throated sparrow. And Zach, is this the one that you said that you wanted to talk about? You like? Um, I don't think I did, but I would say okay. the last little thing is on a nice warm day, you'll hear them sing. And <laughs> um, they're kind of snowbirds like the junco. So they're coming from Canada. So they sing, oh, sweet Canada, Canada, Canada. But as Wendy mentioned here on the slide, <laughs> they sound like they can't sing. I, lo I love this. I think it's, it's young birds learning how to sing. So the nice song is, but you'll often hear, right? Just a mess and you're like, oh. You didn't even, you didn't even make it sound bad enough though. <laughs> oh, what is that bird doing? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so again, these are uh, there are different types of sparrows. This is going to be a common sparrow that you see at your feeders on the ground picking up those seeds that are um, spilled out of your tube feeders. Or if you're like me, I sprinkle um, seeds on the ground below the feeders specifically for these ground feeding birds. So the white throated sparrow has that bright white throat. Okay. And the last one of our ground feeders, again, you can see them on the two feeders too, but a lot of times are on the ground. And this is our Northern Cardinal. Um, many of you are probably familiar with the Cardinal, uh, bright red only on the males. So this is really the only bird around here in the winter time that has this bright red plumage and also has the, what I call it a black mask. It looks like he's wearing a mask which comes down to a beard, okay? So that's only on the males that has that black mask and beard with the bright red feathers. The female is on the right, looks the same as far as the shape and the size. They have that bad hair day going on with the large crest on the top of the head. They can um, have it straight up kind of like the male in this picture. The female has it kind of pointed back a little bit more, but they both have a crest on top of the head. So overall, look the same shape and size. A silhouette looks very similar, but as you can see, the females lack that bright red coloring. So the females overall are kind of um, this light brown, um, tannish color with some tinges of pink or red in the feathers as well. They also both have that really um, orangish or pinkish red beak that's really thick and cone-shaped, very conical, um, because they're gonna be splitting open um, tough seeds like black oil sunflowers and, and things like that. So they need that tough, thick beak to get through those shells. Um, so, and one of the mo more common obvious birds, I think, to identify because of the bright red color and the crest on the top of the head. This is one people ask me, um, say early in winter or, um, or late in the, like in the fall, where cardinals go and the shrubs they're in the bushes right they like thick vegetation and sometimes they might not even be at your feet because there's not a lot of thick vegetation nearby so they're there they're just hiding <laughs> and another thing about the cardinals too is that if you watch your feeders often enough you're going to notice that there are certain times of the day that um, some birds are more active than others so you might see chickadees at one point and then they might disappear for a while and then come back and another species will come in. The cardinals are typically one of the last species of birds to come to your feeder. So they're the ones that are there right before dark, like in the evening. 
um, they're going to be the last ones to come visit. It doesn't mean they're not there during the daytime, but I'm just saying when the other birds are already kind of moving in for the evening, you know, going to roost, the cardinals are still going to be in and around your feeders. So that's another behavioral thing that you're going to look for and notice that these cardinals are going to last longer at your feeders than some of the other species. All right, so moving on to specialty feeders. Um, I put in the downy woodpecker. Woodpeckers love suet um, and also things like peanuts and stuff as well. But if you have a suet feeder at your house, you're going to attract some woodpeckers. So this is probably the most common type of woodpecker that would come to your bird feeding station. And this is a downy woodpecker. Um, Downy woodpeckers are really small, probably the smallest, it's the smallest type of woodpecker that would come to your feeding station. Uh, overall black and white. So usually when people think of woodpeckers, they think of this black and white pattern. So overall black with white checkers on the back um, and the wings. Um, and they do have this striped black and white striped head as well, white belly, okay? The thing you're gonna look for is this red patch on the top of the head, on the cap, kind of on the back between the cap and the nape here. Only the males have that red, that bright red patch. If you look at the bird that's in this oval, that is also a downy woodpecker, but you'll notice that the red patch is not there. That is a female. So the males have this red patch on the crown the females do not have the red patch. Otherwise, very, very similar in patterns and colors between the male and the female. This little guy here on the very right, that's a hairy woodpecker. I threw him in there just because downy woodpeckers and hairy woodpeckers are often confused. Um, and they're not confused. People confuse them with each other. The only real difference, and this might be hard for beginning birders, is the hairy woodpeckers are a smidge bigger than the downy woodpeckers and they have a little bit longer uh, beak. So I don't know if you can see it in the picture here, but the hairy woodpecker has a little bit longer beak than the downy woodpecker. So again, if you're just starting out, that's really difficult to tell the downy apart from the hairy. So that's why we're basically focusing on the downy woodpecker because in most cases, you're gonna see a downy woodpecker at your feeders more than a hairy woodpecker. All right, would you agree, Zach? Yeah, yep, absolutely. All right, so that's the downy woodpecker. Another woodpecker that you might see, not to be confused with the downy woodpecker because it's much larger than the downy woodpecker. This is the red-bellied woodpecker. And this is the one that Zach kind of mentioned a little while ago about um, the, the nape and the crown. So I'm going to let Zach go ahead and tell a little bit about the red belly. So the red belly, like when he was saying, is definitely a bigger woodpecker, right? And But they have this nice contrast between a little bit of red on the nape, a very pale, like yellowy washed belly or chest, I should say. And um, I'm red, green, colorblind. I've never seen this in my whole life. Um, apparently the belly is a little red there and I guess this shows a little pinkish. <laughs> Um, it does, know, yeah, right here. I can, I, I've never seen it. It's, it's tough to see, but keep in mind that's what, why those field mark things we were talking about earlier are important because the belly, and, and I wish you could see me, I'm holding my belly out, right? The belly's way down there, but the chest is not very red. It's very pale yellow. So they have that contrast, that red on the nape, little yellow belly, and this bold stripe it's almost like a striping pattern on the back, black and white, but it looks very gray from a distance rather than, than the black and white spots of a downy woodpecker. It looks very grayish stripe on the back. Um, big bill, right? That's a big, thick black bill. Now, um, this is another one that makes a good bit of sound. So you often hear them chirp, 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 as they're coming into the feeder. I noticed that they don't seem to hang on the feeder for very long. Downy woodpeckers will just sit there and go for like five minutes. You can walk up to them and they'll go, oh, and fly away. Red-bellied woodpeckers will fly in, they'll feed for a little bit and then take off pretty quickly. Um, so big, big 
tail on the on the, the breast, fish stripes on the back, little red on the nape, not red on the head, right? not like dipped in red. Yeah, so over, I mean, if again, if you guys are starting identification, it's not a big deal right away if you can tell the difference between the males and the females of some of these species. We put these on here just to show you that there is a little bit of a difference between the males and the females in some of the species. But right now, if you're just starting out, you can just say, okay, there's this, a large woodpecker um, with mostly black back with some white stripes. Belly is white with a little bit of pink, if you can see it on the very bottom of the belly and red on the neck and or the head. So odd, that must be a red-bellied woodpecker. Um, but you don't have to say, oh, I think that's a female. Uh, we just put that on there just for extra tidbits for you guys. And you can see this picture here up in the circle on the top. That is the female that is showing it does not have red on the crown, on the very top of the head. But you can still see the red going down the nape, the back of the neck, where the one on the right has the red the whole way from like, the base of the bill down the back of the neck, down the nape. So we know that's a male versus the female who doesn't have it on the top of the head. But whether or not you um, can tell that on your bird feeders right away, it's not a big deal. We do baby steps with bird identification. <laughs> Just know it's a larger woodpecker versus the downy woodpecker, which is smaller. Okay, And these, are, these guys too also like suet. Um, they'll eat uh, peanuts, whole peanuts in the shell or shelled peanuts. And another thing too that you might notice when it flies away, just a little extra tidbit, is they, they have white wing patches on their wingtips when they fly away. So when they spread out their wings, there'll be a little patch of white um, on each side that sometimes flashes when they're flying. Okay. Let me get back on my screen. And I think the... Um, second to last guy that we have here is our American goldfinch. Zach, is this the one you said you wanted to talk about? I forget which one you told me. Uh, no, it, I, it was chickadee. I, I think it was oh, just chickadee. chickadee. Okay. <laughs> well, the American goldfinch is another one that um, many people might recognize, but mostly in the summertime, if you look up in the very top left corner, the American goldfinch is very bright yellow with those black wings. And at the beginning, when I mentioned about the parts, the, the body parts, um, we mentioned wing bars. You can see there's a little white stripe on that black wing. So that's called a wing bar. So we would say, this is a small bird, very bright yellow with black wings and a white wing bar. That, was, that would be how you would kind of identify or tell somebody um, about this bird if you wanted someone to help you identify it. So those are some of the identifying characteristics. They also have this black cat. It really stands out against those bright yellow feathers. However, this is one of the only songbirds that molts or loses its feathers and grows new ones in twice a year. So they look completely different or maybe not completely. I mean, they're still same size and shape, but their feathers look different in the winter than they do in the summertime. So people who know American goldfinches from that bright yellow plumage in the summer have a difficult time sometimes identifying them in the winter because they're they're looking for that bright yellow plumage and it, it's just not there in the winter time. So they do molt. You can see the one here in the oval. It looks kind of patchy. So that one is changing um, its feathers from its bright yellow um, to its more uh, kind of a drab. I wrote drab, unstreaked brown in the winter. Um, so it's kind of this drab brown. And unstreaked is very important because there are some finches that are very similar to American goldfinch, um, but they have brown streaks, almost like brown stripes on their breast or on their back, um, which tells them apart from the goldfinch. So a goldfinch does not have any streaks on it. It's very unstreaked. And you might see, you know, little bits of yellow. You can see on this guy's head that there's more brighter yellow showing through but it's still not as brightly colored as what you would think of in the summertime. Still has the white wing bars, the black and white wings. Um, and they do like other finches, they do have this little notched tail that you can see a little bit better in the, um, the oval circle here than this because his looks like his wings are crossed a little bit back there. 
So um, these birds actually prefer what we call Niger seed or thistle seed. Um, and they're really, really small. So you do need a special feeder to put thistle feed um, in. Other, if you put it in a regular tube feeder or in a hopper feeder or something, it's just gonna spill out um, and get wasted. So you do need uh, like a thistle sock that the birds can cling on to um, or a, a thistle feeder, which has smaller, uh, smaller holes in the porch than your regular tube feeders. And again, this is a bird, a type of finch that you'll see in, in flocks, in small flocks. So if you have a, a, a thistle feeder or a thistle sock, you may have a whole bunch of goldfinches clinging onto it at one time, eating the thistle feed. Okay, anything to add, Zach, for the goldfinch? I was just gonna say, it's the finchiest, it's the finch of all finches. <laughs> pointy bill you can see nicely, little fork tail, and it flies in a very undulating shape. It's like, of all the finch characteristics, this has it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, and our last 12 birds of Christmas bird count here is our house finch. Um, and Zach, I'll, I'll let you talk a little bit about the house finch if you would like. I'll hand it over to you. So the house finch is actually a bird that we might not have had in Connecticut, say 50 or 60 years ago. I know where I'm at, Massachusetts, they only started breeding here in the 70s. So it's a bird that is now one of our really more common finches, right? Year round, right? But might not have been when the Christmas bird count started. Um, they're noticed really for their streaking on the breast, very nice continuous streaking going all the way across all the way down to the belly. And notice it's kind of faint streaking. It's not black streaking, right? It blends in with the whole body. So the female on the left is all one streaky brown bird, right? Big, heavy beak of a finch, right? But streaky all around. Notice in the face, it's still streaky. There's tiny streaks in the face, right? There's no whitish patch over the eye or below the eye. It's very streaky. And the males, it looks like you added a faint wash of paint over top. You can still see the streaking underneath. And you can see even above the eye and below the eye, it's still streaky underneath that red. These are, you know, normally you'll see them in small groups, maybe f up to five or 10. Um, they're eating sometimes the, the Niger seed that Wendy was saying. They'll eat uh, black oil sunflowers. Well, well, you notice those beaks are much bigger than the, the goldfinch beaks. So they'll definitely eat that. Um, they can be pretty noisy. They make little finchy sounds. <laughs> if you can um, picture what a finchy sound is, right? <laughs> um, but one thing is they're, they're kind of almost nondescript other than the streaking. The female house finch is, is just all basically one color. It doesn't have those nice white wing bars like the goldfinch. You might see some brownish wing bars, but not those nice wing bars. Not a lot of color other than brown and white on this bird. Yeah, and I did want to point out um, the house finches are, are, are often um, misidentified and people think that they are purple finches, which can also come to your feeders in the winter time. And I have to admit, sometimes it's even difficult for me when I first, when I see a male it, to tell if it's a house finch or a purple, purple finch right away. So it does take some practice. Um, I put the purple finches up in the top right hand corner of the screen just for comparison. Um, but remember I said that these birds are not always the same as what you're gonna see in the field guides or on pictures. So a lot of times people will see a male house finch and, and think, oh, it's really red or really purple in color. It has to be a purple finch. Um, but that's not always the case. The purple finch though, if you can see the difference up in the corner, it's really, looks like there's a lot more purple or rosy red color to it. And somebody always told me, there was someone who always told me that it looked like someone would take a, a finch and, and just kind of dip its body head first down into like some grape jelly or raspberry jelly. It's like color, just covered in raspberry jelly where a house finch will have that red coloring, but not quite as much. So if that helps you 
uh, you know, if you think of a bird, I know it's kind of weird to think about some of these things, but you do what you have to do to help identify. If you think of someone dipping a bird into some raspberry jelly, that's more of the purple finch. It's really brighter and has more of that, those red tones to it. But sometimes the house finches too can look a little bit more reddish purple than other house finches. So they're really hard to tell apart sometimes. The big difference between the females are, you can see the female purple finch has that white um, eyebrow or the eye stripe where the house finch female does not have that. So the females are a little bit easier to tell apart than the males. So I just wanted to put the purple finch up there for comparison. If you can just narrow it down to say, to being, oh, it's a finch, it could be a house finch or a purple finch, then you're, you're doing great for, for beginning birding. All right. So those were the 12 birds of Christmas bird count. And just for fun, we actually threw in a bonus because <laughs> um, not all birds that you see around your bird feeders are actually eating the seeds that are your bird feeder. So it is not uncommon to see um, one of these guys hanging around your feeders. We have Cooper's hawks and Sharpshin hawks. These are both um, hawks that are known as occipiters, which have long pointed wings for flying really fast. They have long skinny tails for flying really fast and changing direction very quickly. And both of these birds are known for um, eating smaller birds. They have long skinny toes. They can catch the birds while in flight. Um, and since one of their favorite foods are smaller songbirds, they are typically found around bird feeders where there are a lot of birds hanging out because it's an easy uh, lunch stop for them. So if there is a hawk that is around your yard or sitting above your feeders, you're gonna notice that there's not a lot of activity at your feeders. Those little birds usually know when those hawks are around. So if all of a sudden, if your feeders are really busy and, and full of activity, and then all of a sudden all the birds scatter and it's quiet, if you look around, chances are you might see one of these birds perched in a nearby tree or flying over your house and those birds know it and they usually go for cover. Um, sometimes they do, um, catch maybe a bird that is um, maybe a little sick or sometimes birds get conjunctivitis which is a condition in the eye and it makes them go blind in one or both eyes so if they can't see as well um, it makes them susceptible to um, to these hawks but hawks are found around feeders because they feed on small mammals and birds so just keep your eye out for the cooper's hawks and the sharp shin hawks too. Okay. We got a really good question here and I said, oh, it's a quiz. <laughs> what's, uh, what's the middle bird? <laughs> oh, for me? Yeah, go, or do you want me to do it? <laughs> so, oh, no, I thought you were asking them if they knew. Was well, it no, for me? it was I know what it is because I even put the picture on there. So. <laughs> no, someone asked it in the chat. So what, Oh, okay. okay. I thought you were asking <laughs> me. <laughs> so the middle, the middle bird, right, they're tough. There's an overlap in size. So that's one thing. And Here's what, what I think is a good indicator is the head, all right? The head for a sharp shinned hawk looks like it's three times too small, all right? So for the head for a Cooper's hawk, it sticks out from the body. It looks very proportional, but the sharp shinned hawk head looks very small, all right? And so if you see the bird on the left, right, that head kind of gets tucked in there a little bit, all right? And even the bird on the right, that head sticks out a little bit, right? And the sharp shins hawk no, known for having the squarish tail like on the left, right? Very pointy on the ends and not very round. Yeah, I, I purposefully did not put in the differences between the Cooper's hawks and the sharp shin hawks because even um, people who work with hawks on a regular basis get stumped by these two. So identifying um, the Coopers versus the sharp chin is, is rather difficult. And um, I mean, we can say what Zach just said, you know, about the size of the head and stuff, but when you are looking at a bird like this, who might be perched on a tree or sometimes even when you have it in the hand, like we do at the Audubon Center, they look so very similar and it takes a little bit of time to 
identify them. So I purposely didn't put it on there just because it's, it's, it's rather tricky to tell them apart. The thing is with most raptors, the females are larger than the males. Um, so a, let me see here, the sharp shinned hawks are usually smaller. So a female sharp shinned hawk is about the same size as a male Cooper's hawk because the male Cooper's hawk is smaller. So they're just so hard to tell apart even between the sexes of the of the two because of, because of the size and the colorings are about the same, the markings are about the same. So it's tricky. Just if you can just tell there's a hawk there, and it's either a sharp shin or a Cooper's, you're doing good. <laughs> so do you want to give the answer to the middle picture? Oh, that, darn it, I did it again. <laughs> that one's a Cooper's hawk, actually, in the picture. So the big key there, what, like I said, that head, you see how big the head is, right? It sticks out. It looks proportioned. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we have the, the Sharpie on the left, Cooper's on the middle on the right. All right, so I'm going to actually stop sharing and see were there any questions in the chat that um, can the you did not get to can the conjunctivitis affect the predatory birds. Uh, typically not conjunctivitis again is um, an illness that the birds get and it's very contagious to the other birds. Um, it's not really an, an eye disease, um, but it affects the eyes and it makes them either crusty or kind of pussy or runny. Sorry not to be gross, but um, sometimes it'll actually um, close shut, swell shut and be so crusted that they can't see. So it can be affected in one or both eyes. And then when they put the heads into the ports of the feeders, that will kind of, you know, it touches the, the ports. And then when another bird comes, they stick their head in that same port and then they get the conjunctivitis as well. Typically, if um, something like a sharp shin hawk is gonna come by and get those birds, they're not gonna get it um, on their eye and they, they can eat it with no problem. We know at our rehabilitation clinic, um, we don't typically see uh, raptors with conjunctivitis. It's usually small songbirds and most of the time, um, they are finches. So finches are really susceptible to it. So we get a lot of gold finches, house finches, and purple finches. Occasionally pine siskins, which we didn't mention on today's um, program, but they're very similar to the goldfinch with a lot of streaking. So mostly the finches are the ones who end up with the conjunctivitis. Uh, one other question was, uh, is this going to be shared, this presentation afterwards, and where? Uh, I, yeah, I can I can send it out to everybody if you would like if the slides will help you with identification I can because this is being recorded I think I missed like the first 30 seconds of you talking but <laughs> um, but the slides are on there and I can I can send out slides to anybody who would like them to again you can just let me know sounds like there's there's support for that <laughs> awesome. were there any other uh, questions about any of the slides or identifying any of the birds. I know it was really quick. I know there's a lot of them, but um, if you look for those identifying factors and you have a good field guide with you, or I guess there's lots of great bird apps um, for your phone. Um, some of them, you can even take a picture of the bird and um, it will try to identify it for you. So you don't have to do the legwork and try to look it up. <laughs> um, but there's a lot of great bird apps out there as well that will help. Um, yeah, as Zach mentioned, eBird. Um, I'm gonna just type in uh, a whole bunch of different uh, apps and resources. So the more you do this, like you said, if you're interested in joining us for Christmas bird count, or I know a lot of you are not local, um, if you wanna join your own local Christmas bird count, um, you can find out information. There is a website just on Christmas bird count, right, Zach, with all the different locations that they can look into? Yep. If you search Christmas bird count, you'll come right to the, the National Audubon Society. Yep. And find out how they can join. And then um, there's also Project Feeder Watch, which is going on right now. Um, there's great backyard bird counts. All of those are kind of community science programs that you can do, you can participate in right from your own home. So Project Feeder Watch is similar to Christmas bird count, but obviously you just sit in the comforts of your own home. So grab a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or 
hot chocolate or whatever you want to drink, snuggle in the blanket and watch your feeders and you can actually help with these, um, the, all this data that these scientists are collecting and trying to figure out what the birds are doing this winter and what their populations are doing. So all of those um, are great ways to continue learning your winter bird identification and, and helping out at the same time. Are there any questions? Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I don't see anybody's. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, please feel please feel free to email either one of us. You have, um, I think Zach gave his email at the beginning and um, all of you guys have my email from the registration link for today. So it's wendy.miller at audubon.org and be happy to get back to you and answer your questions. If you need any help with Project Feeder Watch, that's also on our website, which is sharon.audubon.org. So there's information on the Christmas bird count and Project Feeder Watch on our website as well. And uh, thank you again. So have a great day. Happy holidays, everybody. Happy bird watching. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. Bye-bye. Thank you.